Günaydınlar herkese. Değerli katılımcılar, panelimizin bu bölümünde bugün invaziv fungal enfeksiyonlarla ilgili e, Türkiye'deki epidemiolojik verileri ve e, tanıdaki zorlukları, tedavi yaklaşımları konusunda anlatmak üzere bir ülkemizden iki tane de Almanya'dan değerli konuşmacımız var. Ben şimdi ilk konuşmacı olarak Türkiye'deki invaziv fungal enfeksiyonların epidemiolojisini anlatmak üzere Doktor Nur Yapar'ı davet ediyorum. Buyurun. Öncelikle tüm katılımcıları günaydın demek istiyorum. Teşekkür ediyorum Sayın Başkanlar. E, kongre düzenleme kuruluna e, invazi fungal enfeksiyonlar konusunda bana da konuşma fırsatı verdiği için özellikle de böyle iki değerli e, uluslararası bilim adamıyla birlikte aynı oturumda konuşma fırsatı verdiği için de teşekkür etmek istiyorum. E, benim sizinle paylaşmaya çalışacağım konu Türkiye'deki invazi fungal enfeksiyonların epidemiolojisi. E, oldukça zor geldi açıkçası bana bu konu. Neden zor geldi? Çünkü e, uğraşan herkesin bildiği gibi Türkiye'de verimiz var ama ulaşması oldukça zor. <gülüyor> ama çok büyük zevk aldığımı e, itiraf etmek istiyorum. E, daha önce görmediğim, ulaşamadığım pek çok meslektaşımın yayınlarıyla e, karşılaştım. Bayağı da bir arşivim oldu açıkçası bu açıdan. E, invazi fungal enfeksiyonlar Türkiye'de çok uzun zamandır aslında ilgi çekiyor. E, mikoloji çok eski bir bilim dalı bizde ve çok uğraşan e, hocalarımız var. Ama tabii ki 2000'lerden sonra biraz daha fazla e, ilgi arttı bu konuya, farkındalık arttı. Yayın sayısı da doğal olarak o tarihten itibaren arttı. E, epidemioloji geçiyor e, başlıkta sözlük olarak. Bir hata yapmayalım, epidemiolojinin tanımına bakalım önce istedim. Toplumda sağlık ve hastalık durumlarının belirleyici faktörleri ve dağılımını inceleyen bir bilim dalı. O zaman biz de bugün e, bu, burada e, daha çok dağılım, biraz da belki belirleyici faktörlerden bahsedeceğiz. E, ama invazif fungal enfeksiyonlarının risk e, faktörleri çok da birbirinden farklı değil açıkçası. O nedenle ben daha çok dağılım üzerinde durmaya çalışacağım. E, sunum planımda sık görülen, daha sık görülen e, invazi fungal enfeksiyonlar üzerinde durmaya çalıştım doğal olarak. E, tabii ki bu konularda veri bulmak da daha kolay. Başta kandida enfeksiyonları geliyor. Tüm dünyada olduğu gibi ülkemizde de kandida ile ilgili verimiz mevcut. Yine ardından e, özel gruplar başta olmak üzere aspergillus enfeksiyonları sık. Yine bu konuda da bir miktarda olsa verimiz var. Bir miktarda zigomikozla ilgili verimiz artmaya başladı. Özellikle varikonozol, varikonozolin yaygın kullanımı veya azol profilaksisi sonrası riskli gruplarda zigomicet enfeksiyonları artmaya başladığı için biraz ilgi arttı. Bu konuda yayın var mı diye açıkçası sunum planımı bu şekilde yaptım. Türkiye'deki özellikle yerli veriye ulaşabilmek için Kaynaklarımız biraz sınırlı, son yıllara kadar daha da sınırlıydı ama biraz artmaya başladı. Daha ulaşılabilir veri tabanları, taranabilir veri tabanları mevcut. Bir tane eser var, bunu burada bahsetmeden geçemeyeceğim. Tüm bay ve arkadaşlarının Emel Hocam, mikolojiyi Ege kökenli olanlara sevdiren hocamız. Çok eski, 1800'lerden başlayarak... Türkiye'deki e, mantar enfeksiyonları konusunda yapılmış yayınları bir kaynakça da topladılar. 2004 yılına kadar bu kaynakça. E, yayın listesi olarak gerçekten hoş bir eser. Ancak 2004 yılında bitmesi bir e, dezavantajı. Çünkü 2004'lerden sonra yayın konusunda Türkiye'de daha bir farkındalık, daha bir fazlalık söz konusu. Ama bunun devamını da hocamızın getirmeye çalıştığını biliyorum. Yine bir kaynak taraması içerisinde. Tabii ki hepimizin yayın tararken kullandığı bir e, arama motoru PubMed ve e, yine yerli veri tabanları içerisinde benim en geniş bulduğum ULAKBİM'in Ulusal Tip Veri 
veri tabanı. Tabii ki başka veri tabanları da söz konusu ama e, en geniş olarak bulabildiğim bu ulak benimde 1996'dan 2012'ye kadar yayınları taramayı sağlıyor. E, mikoloji ve mantar hastalıkları kaynakçasına baktığımızda biraz tarihçeden bahsedeyim. Candida ile ilgili ilk yayın burada 1906 yılında yapılmış bir olgu sunumu ülkemizden. Aspergillus daha geç kalmış. 1924'te yapılmış ilk yayın e, Aspergillus ile ilgili. Ama 2004'e kadar Candida ve Aspergillus yayınlarına baktığınızda bunların çoğunun tek tek olgu sunumları olduğunu, klinik serilere pek yer verilmediğini görebiliyoruz. Diğer arama motorları ve teknolojiyi kullanarak bulabildiklerime bakarsak önce birkaç örnek vermek istiyorum. Kullandığım anahtar kelimeler ve bulduğum e, yayınlarla ilgili. Örneğin Candida ve Türkiye başlıklarını kullandığımda PubMed'de 763 tane yayın çıkıyor ki e, bunların içerisinde gerçekten Türkiye'den yapılmış Candida ile ilgili çalışmalar olduğu gibi Türkiye kelimesinin e, dezavantajından dolayı Hindilerde yapılmış çalışmalar da çıkıyor maalesef. Onları elemeniz gerekiyor aradan. E, Candida yalnızca yazdığınızda böyle yayın. Tabii ki başka anahtar kelimeler de kullanılabilir. Ben yalnızca örnekleri getirdim. İnanın bu kadar değil kullandığım anahtar kelimeler. Bunu birazcık epidemioloji kelimesinin içine sokarsanız yayın sayısı birden 103'e düşüyor epidemiyolojik veri dediğinizde. Yine burada da çok değerli araştırmacılarımızın yayınları söz konusu. Kandidayı invazif kandidiyazisa çevirdiğinizde yalnızca 19 tane yayına ulaşabiliyoruz. Tabi burada anahtar kelime sorunu olabilir. Yayınlarımızda kullandığımız anahtar kelimelerde sıkıntı olabilir. Yine ulaşılabilmek için belki de indekslere uyumlu anahtar kelimeleri de kullanmamız gerekiyor. Mutlaka e, içimizden ulaşamadığım Araştırıcılarımızın yayınları vardır bunların içerisinde diye düşünüyorum. Ulusal veri tabanına geldiğimizde güzel bir veri tabanı Ulak Bim'in e, Türk Tıp e, veri tabanı kullandığım <gülüyor> 1996'dan günümüze kadar dediğim gibi ve burada yine Candida K ile olabilir C ile olabilir değişik versiyonlarını denedim bunu. E, 63 tane yayın çıkarabildi e, Türkiye'den bu e, şey bana bu e, anahtar kelime bana. Biraz kısıtladım. İmvaziv kandidiyaz yazdım örneğin. İsimlendirme konusunda da biraz sıkıntımız var Türkiye'de. Kandidiyaz, kandidiyazes, kandidoz şeklinde değişik isimlendirmeler kullandığımız için bu e, anahtar kelimeyle hiçbir şey bulamadı. Kandidoz yazdığımda da bir tane yayın bulabildi açıkçası. Ama sonra tek tek taradığımda birkaç yayına ulaşabildim. Açıkçası bu, bu kadar şeyi niye anlattım? E, darılanlar olabilir meslektaşlarımızın arasında. Bizim de yayınımız vardı bulamamışsınız diye. E, ulaşmak için e, biraz da e, sarf ettiğim çabayı da göstermek istedim açıkçası size. Şimdi samanlıkta arayarak bulduğum iğnelerden çıkardığım örnekleri vermek istiyorum. Sizinle paylaşmak istiyorum. Öncelikle hastane enfeksiyonları içerisinde kandidaların yeriyle ilgili bayağı verimiz var. Hastane enfeksiyonlarını tararken özellikle kan dolaşımı enfeksiyonlarının içerisinde kandidalar bizde de Avrupa'da ve Amerika'da tüm dünyada olduğu gibi ön sıralara yerleşmeye başladı. Örneğin 2006 yılında Antalya'dan bir çalışma tüm hastane genelini almış kan dolaşımı enfeksiyonları içerisinde kandidalar 6. sırada. 2010'a gel geldiğimizde dördüncü sıralara doğru yükselmeye başladığını görüyoruz. Örneğin yine yoğun bakım ünitesindeki çalışmada yüzde on iki gibi kandidaların e, enfeksiyonlar içerisindeki oranı yine kan dolaşımı enfeksiyonları yeni doğan ünitesi gibi riskli bir yerde de yüzde altılarla dördüncü sıralara ulaşabilmiş kan dolaşımı enfeksiyonlar içerisinde kandidalar. Demek ki oldukça sık. E, toplumda sıklığı vermek e, epidemiyolojik açıdan önemli ama topluma yönelik bir verimiz yok maalesef. Yani toplum kökenli enfeksiyonlarda kandidalar aspergillus'lar bizim nüfus başı ne kadar çıkar? Böyle bir ulusal verimiz yok. Ee, bunların çoğunun e, ihbarı da zorunlu olmadığı için böyle bir şeye ulaşamıyorsunuz ama e, sıklık veren bir takım çalışmalar var. 2006 yılından bizim çalışmamız e, başvuru başına vermişiz. E, <gülüyor> Kandida enfeksiyonlarının sıklığını o zamanki sistemimiz nedeniyle 10 bin başvuruda 5.6 bulmuşuz. Sıklık verme konusunda da değişik parametreler var. O nedenle ben bunları gruplamaya çalıştım. Hasta yatak günü başına verilen sıklığı e, başvuru veya yüzde olarak verilenle karşılaştırmanız çok mümkün olmuyor. Hastane genelinde yalnızca kan dolaşımı enfeksiyonları ile ilgili bir sıklık bu. Ama 2011 yılında örneğin bizden 5 yıl sonra bir e, çalışma var Edirne'den. Burada yine hastane genelinde 
geneli ve kan didemilere baktığımızda 10 bin başvuruda 16.8 gibi bulmuşlar ki bu bir artış olarak değerlendirilebilir. Her ne kadar bölgesel burada sunmaya çalıştığım bütün veriler hastaneden hastaneye, bölgeden bölgeye fark etse de 5.6'dan 16.8'e çıkmış gibi görünebilir. Böyle yorumlamak ne kadar doğru ben de bilmiyorum açıkçası. Bölge farkı var çünkü. Yine yatak günü başına e, biraz daha güvenli bir e, sıklık e, verme yöntemi olarak incelediğimizde 2010 yılında iki tane çalışma var. Her ikisi de hastane geneli ve kandidemi oranlarını veriyor. E, biri İstanbul, biri Bursa'dan. Burada da çok farklı oranları e, görüyoruz. 10 bin hasta yatış gününde 0.58 İstanbul'dan olan merkezin, tek merkez tabii bunlar e, oran böyleyken Bursa'dan e, veren oranda 2.9 gibi bir orana ulaşabiliyoruz. Burada her iki hastanenin birbirinden farkı çok önemli. İşte organ nakli yapılması, riskli hastaya bakması, yoğun bakımlarının e, boyutu hepsi son derece önemli. Çok karşılaştırılabilir mi bilmiyorum ama e, böyle veriler var. Yine yoğun bakım üniteleriyle ilgili iki çalışma var. Bir tanesi yine İstanbul'dan, birisi İzmir'den bizim çalışmamız. Burada yoğun bakımı özel e, aldığınız zaman oranların benzediğini görüyorsunuz. 3.22 bulmuş İstanbul grubu, biz de 3.38 bulduk. Yoğun bakım ünitemizde kandida enfeksiyonlarının insidans tansitesini hasta yatış günü açısından. E, toparlayacak olursak özel hasta gruplarında yoğun bakımlarda oldukça yüksek bir e, insidansımız var, sıklığımız var. Ama hastane genelinde de kandidalar oldukça sık enfeksiyon ajanları olmaya başlamışlar. Yine özel hasta gruplarında değişik oranlar var değişik araştırıcıların. Örneğin yeni doğan burada önemli. Yeni doğanda kandida enfeksiyonları yoğun bakımında özellikle salgınlar yapabilmesi açısından önemli. Yüzde 1.1 vermiş 2012 yılı yayını araştırıcılar. Ama hastanenin özelliklerine ait çok fazla veri elde edemedim yayından açıkçası. Yine karaciğer transplant alıcılarında yüzde 3.2 gibi bir oran var ama hasta sayısı az. Bu da yine bizden bir çalışma. Ee, ama hasta sayısı çok büyük değil. Pediatrik hematolojik malinitelerde de yine riskli grup doğaldır. Yüzde 7.7 gibi bir oran var. Buradan sıklığa baktığımızda kandida önemli yerlere gelmiş. Ülkemizde de bunu görebiliyoruz. Bir ayrıntı bizim çalışmamızda 2006 yılında e, bin başvuruda 0.56 ya da işte 10 bin başvuruda e, 5.6 gibi bir oranımız vardı. Yıllar içerisinde biz buna kendi içimizde baktığımızda bir artış olduğunu ve bu artışın istatistiksel anlamlı olduğunu gördük. Yine yoğun bakım ünitesinde yaptığımız çalışmada da özellikle 2004-2006 arasında e, yıllar içerisinde anlamlı bir artış olduğunu gördük. Ee, şurada 2006 yılında bir pik yaptığını görüyorsunuz. Bu bizim hastanemizde inşaatların da pik yaptığı, yoğun bakımımızın da taşındığı yıl açıkçası. Yatak sayımızda da bir fırlama olup ama hemşire sayımızın bunu takip edemediği yıllardan bir tanesi maalesef salgın. Şimdi her ne kadar Türkiye verileri olsa da neredeyiz dünyada onu da karşılaştırmak açısından birkaç Avrupa'dan veri. Ee, yine yoğun bakım ünitelerinde yapılmış çalışmalar. Ee, i̇şte 10 bin hasta yatış gününde 2005 yılında 15.8 bulmuş araştırıcılar kandidemi e, insidansını. Ee, biz bunun yaklaşık e, iki katı gibi insidanslara sahibiz yoğun bakım ünitelerimizde diye düşünüyorum. Avrupa'dan biraz fazlayız. Bu da enfeksiyon kontrol önlemleriyle ilgili bir şey. İkinci üzerinde durmaya çalışacağım konu etken dağılımı. Çünkü kandida da yıllardır ee, en az son 10-15 yıldır etken spektrumunun albikanstan nonalbikansa doğru kaymaya başladığı yönünde bir e, eğilim var. Yayınlarda böyle bir eğilim var açıkçası. E, bu bizim ülkemizde ne durumda ona bakmak e, istersek. <gülüyor> Amerika'da glabrata daha ön planda ama Avrupa'da e, glabratadan çok daha diğer e, albikans dışı kandidalar ön planda. Bizim 2006'da yaptığımız çalışmada albikans ön sıradaydı yüzde 57 hatta 58 gibi bir oranla. Ama hemen arkasından gelenlere de bakarsanız glabrata gibi dirençli kökenler değil, tropikalis veya parapsilozis gibi azole daha da duyarlı olabilecek kökenler söz konusu burada. Ee, yine bizim 2008 yılında Ege bölgesinde çok merkezli yaptığımız bir çalışma. Burada da albikansın başta olduğunu yine tropikalis ve parapsilozis ile takip edildiğini görüyoruz. O nedenle en azından Ege bölgesi kendi bölgemiz için söyleyebiliyoruz ki albikans dışı dirençli kandidalar çok da büyük sorunumuz değil açıkçası. Bizim glabrata, kefir, kuruzeyi gibi kandidalar oldukça e, nadir olarak görünüyorlar.
Yoğun bakımlarımıza baktığımızda da yine büyük oranda kandida albikansın etken olduğunu, bunun parapsilozis tarafından takip edildiğini görüyoruz ki bu da yoğun bakım açısından doğal bir süreç kateter enfeksiyonu ile ilişkili ve salgın yapan bir e, kandida olması dolayısıyla. Türkiye genelinde özetleyecek olursak etken dağılımı nasıl bulabildiğim veya seçebildiğim çalışmalarda bayağı çalışma var etken dağılımıyla da ilgili. <gülüyor> Burada en yüksek oran olarak %65.6'yı görüyoruz kandida albikans için. E, bu çalışma tüm hastane örneklerini yoğun bakımdan gelen tüm örnekleri idrar dahil içeren bir çalışma. Örnek sayısı fazla ama içine baktığınızda idrar sayısı biraz fazla. E, etkenliği konusunda da e, yayında bir şey verilmemiş mutlaka etkendir ama e, oldukça yüksek. En düşük oran ise yüzde otuzla verilmiş yine kan örnekleri ve hastane genelinde. Bunu da yine her hastanenin kendi içinde bilmesi de önemli. Önemli ama e, ulusal verimize de bu açıdan ulaşmamız önemli. Yüzde otuzla yüzde altmış beş oranında değişen kandida albikans oranları var ülkemizde. Bunun bölgesel farklılıklar gösterdiği söyleniyor ama bölgesel farklılıklar biraz kıtalar arası bölgesel farklılıklar. Aynı ülkede niye bu kadar farklı bunu e, bulabilmek için herhalde çok merkezli çalışmalara ihtiyacımız var. Bundan sonra aspergillus ve mukordan bahsetmeye çalışacağım ama açıkçası kandida gibi şanslı değiliz burada. Yalnız üzülmemek lazım. Dünyada da zaten aspergillus ve mukor gibi daha nadir etkenlere geldiğimizde epidemiyolojik veriler çok fazla değil. Yine aynı çalışma, aynı şekilde anahtar kelimelerimi göstermek istedim. O giderek azalan sayıda yayınlara ulaşıyoruz bu keywordleri eklediğimiz zaman. <gülüyor> Yine ulak bin veri tabanında 96 ile başlayıp 14'e kadar düşüyorsunuz invazif eklediğinizde başınızda. Ve yayınların çoğunu mikrobiyolojik veriler, gerçekten çok değerli mikrobiyolojik çalışmalar var. Özellikle Aspergillus ile ilgili tanı testlerinin değerine yönelik çok güzel çalışmalar var. Ama maalesef olgu serimiz e, neredeyse yok gibi bu konuyla ilgili. E, özellikle altta yatan hastalığı olan gruplarda. İki tane çalışmaya örnek vereceğim. 296 böbrek transplant alıcısında yapılmış bir çalışmada invaziv aspergilloz oranı %2.3 bulmuş araştırıcılar. 2002 yılı yayını yaklaşık 10-11 yıllık bir yayın ama oldukça fazla sayıda böbrek transplant alıcısı o zaman için oluşturulmuş. Yine tek merkez maalesef birkaç merkez birleşip yayın veri verselerdi daha güvenli olabilirdi herhalde ama bu da gelecektir diye düşünüyorum. Tek tek merkezler birleşecek. Yine 2003 yılında bu da başkentin yanılmıyorsam bir çalışması. 33 karaciğer transplantasyon, 258 böbrek transplantasyon alıcısı içerisinde toplam invaziv pulmoner fungal infeksiyon oranını vermişler araştırıcılar. Bunun ne kadar aspergillus ne kadar kandida ayıramıyorum açıkçası. Ama yine karaciğerde yüzde 9, böbrekte yüzde 2.3 gibi akciğer akciğer fungal infeksiyon infeksiyonlarını vermişler. <gülüyor> Toplamda 9 infeksiyonları var. Açıkçası Aspergillus epidemiolojisi dediğimizde gerek türlere ait, gerek risk faktörlerine, gerekse toplumdaki yaygınlığına ait çok fazla verimiz yok. Ee, ulaşabildiklerinin içerisinden e, seçebildiklerim bunlar. Zigomikoz yine e, artmaya başlayan, önemi artan bir e, fungal etkenimiz. Aynı sırayla gidersek mukormikozis, zigomikozis gibi değişik e, anahtar kelimelerle yayınlara ulaşmak mümkün. E, Türk tıp tabanında da e, aynı e, verileri tekrarlıyoruz. Şimdi burada bulabildiğim en e, geniş seri açıkçası Ege Üniversitesi'nin yayını Arda ve arkadaşlarının yaptığı yayın. 12 olgu değerlendirilmiş retrospektif olarak ve bu yayında işte olguların klinik verilerinin daha çok rinoorbital mukormikoz olduğu, olguların çoğunun diyabetik olduğu, hematolojik malignitenin daha az olduğunu görmekteyiz. Ve etken sıklığı da 5 tanesinde etken izole edilebilmiş, rizopus ve bir olguda da mukor olarak etken sıklığı verilmiş. Ulaşabildiğim en geniş seri yine tek merkez verisi. Çok merkezli bir çalışma yine Ege bölgesi bizim grubumuzun yapmış olduğu bir çalışma. 2011 Ekmit'te sunuldu henüz yayınlanmadı. 16 olgumuz var. 8 merkez ancak 16 olgu toplayabildik. 
<gülüyor> çok sık bir enfeksiyon değil e, ya da e, tanısal olarak atladığımız bir enfeksiyon. Yedi olgumuz rino orbito serebral, çoğu diyabetik bizim hastalarımızın da e, üç olgu rino orbital, üç olgu da dissemine zigomikos görmüşüz. Yine burada da e, yedi tanesinde etken izolasyonu mümkün yaklaşık yarısında rizopus mukor ve rizomukor türleri sırayla gitmekteler etken olarak. Şimdi ben sunumuma son verirken bir özet yapmak yerine e, hep e, eve dönüş mesajları olur e, yurtdışı kongrelerde. Burada böyle bir e, mesaj çıkarabilir miyiz toplu halde diye düşünüyorum. Şu soruları hep düşünmemiz gerektiğini e, aklıma getiriyorum. E, yeterli verimiz niye yok acaba? Bizim hastalarımız da e, çeşitli risk faktörlerine sahip. Bizim hekimlerimiz de tanısal açıdan her türlü imkana e, pek çok merkezde sahip. Yeterli veriyi niçin üretemiyoruz? Ulusal bir verimiz niye yok? Birbirimizden verilerimizi mi saklıyoruz? Ulaşılamayan veri bir şey ifade etmiyor. Mutlaka herkesin çalışmaları var ama böyle ulaşmaya çalıştığınızda ulaşamıyorsunuz. Çok merkezli çalışma niye yapamıyoruz? Bundan sonra yapabilir miyiz? Bildirilerimiz var, kongre bildirileri çok güzel ama hiçbir şekilde ulaşamıyorsunuz. Kongre kitaplarında kalıyor. Şimdi bir miktar internet ortamında erişilmeye başladı ve bunların çoğu yayın olmuyorlar. Bildirilere baktığınızda çok değerli bir veri var orada ama yayına dönüşmediği sürece anlamı yok. Ve varsa da yeni tarama motorlarıyla, yeni kayıtlarla bunlara ulaşmamız lazım. Bir şekilde verilerim, verimizi değerlendirmemiz lazım diye düşünüyorum. Ee, beni dinlediğiniz için teşekkür ediyorum, saygılar sunuyorum. Sayın Yapar'a çok teşekkür ediyoruz bu güzel sunumu için. Dilerseniz e, her konuşmanın sonunda tartışmaya katkı ve sorularınızı da bitirelim. Daha sonra diğer konuşmalara geçelim. Var mı herhangi bir sorusu olan veya katkısı olan insanların demek de şu anda? Görmüyorum ki konu oldukça net olarak anlaşıldı sanıyorum. Çok teşekkür ediyoruz. İkinci konuşmacıyı e, sunmaktan e, gerçekten onur duyuyorum. E, üçüncüyü sunarken de aynı cümleyi sarf edeceğim. Çünkü e, sizin de bildiğiniz gibi e, bu konudaki kılavuzları oluşturan kişilerden dinleyeceğiz. E, bundan sonraki konuşmaları da e, tıpkı ülkemizdeki katkıları yapanlardan ilk konuşmayı dinlediğimiz gibi. Şimdi ikinci konuşmacımız bir radyolog ee, ama hani e, febril nötropeni konusunda HRCT'yi kullanıma sokan e, kişi. E, Klaus Peter Hoysen, e, diagnostik ve intervensiyonel yani girişimsel radyolojinin şefi e, Heidelberg Üniversitesi'nde görevli kendisi. Ve gerçekten dediğim gibi kılavuzlara giren yaklaşımları nasıl e, gerçekleştirdiğini paylaşacak bizimle. It's our pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for the obvious kind introduction. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm uh, kind of an alien with you because I'm a radiologist. And um, anyhow, I would like to give you an overview about your possible cooperation and the, uh, the helps that a radiologist might, might give to you. Um, since my topic is to talk about problems in the diagnosis of fungal infection, I also want to introduce some solutions together with mentioning the problems. So first, we start uh, with uh, the needs uh, when to perform imaging. And all of you know that the mortality um, of an fungal infection rises significant from about 10% to 30% only by waiting half a day with the start of the treatment. And within half this day, um, the diagnostic should, um, should take place. So radiological imaging, taking specimens, all this stuff should take place within these delay, and therefore this delay should be as short as possible. So to query for radiological imaging is a query not to wait until the next free slot. It is a, an emergency in severely immunocompromised patients. Let's also uh, talk about the cost effectiveness of radiological imaging. 
for instance, a CT scan or a scan using MRI is about 300 or, three, uh, or 200 euro per scan. In comparison to a cycle of prophylaxis or even a cycle of treatment of with antifungals, this imaging might be cost-effective if, uh, if you are able to avoid such a treatment. So imaging might be cost-effective. Which type of imaging are we performing then? Since we know in severely immunocompromised hosts, mainly the lungs are the main affected organ systems. If we perform chest X-ray, we know nowadays that the sensitivity in severely immunocompromised patients is low because the immune system that reacts to the uh, microorganism is not there. It's not available at this time, and therefore the, the size of the infiltrate is small. Therefore, we have to look with a more sensitive technology like CT is. And here we have a patient suffering from acute myeloic leukemia, and she was febrile under an, an empiric antibiotic treatment. And she did not defer sense. So we did a chest X-ray on this day, and since this was read as normal, even in the second plane, we performed a CT scan on the same day. And this CT scan shows a severe ill-defined nodule on the left upper lobe. And even in retrospect, we cannot depict it here. And it took, in this case, it took five additional days until we were able to depict it on chest X-ray, and it's even hard to depict that, uh, especially in this relatively light room. And I have another example for you, also in a patient suffering from acute myeloid leukemia and fever, and she was um, ex imaged with this chest X-ray and nothing was found. The CT scan the same day derived this small nodule. I zoom that a little bit for you so you can depict it easier. And it's a very tiny lesion, but it's surrounded by a halo sign, so it's clearly indicative for a fungal infection. And in this case, it took three weeks, and this significant growth from this size to this size, and further lesions are found later on, and we are now able to depict it on chest X-ray. So only in a very late stage we are able to image those lesions on chest X-ray. Now well, chest X-ray is not the adequate technique. We need to go for CT. And this image pair shows in an, in also a leukemic patient who was in a relatively good condition. He went to the radiological department by himself, and he was, of course, feb febrile. But this image shows that the uh, pneumonia exactly knows about the weaknesses of chest X-ray. And that is the superimposition by the mediastinum and the vertebral spine. And if you see the CT that has been taken at the same day, you see the bronchopneumonia in projection on the, on the vertebral spine and in projection on the mediastinum. These are the, re the regions where chest X-ray is weak. Which type of CT do we need nowadays? And CT is not a push button where you press and get a CT. CT has multiple different technical uh, variations, and frequently we get a sick section CT if we request from a radiologist a CT of the chest. Because radiologists want to save time, and, to, uh, and the fast scan is a scan with six slices. And six slices, if you scan a lung that has 30 centimeters, and you scan with six slices of 10 millimeters, then you have only 30 images to read. That is also time effective. But if you do that, and I gave you the opportunity to, re to have a look at these images for a while, you don't see the lesion. You need thinner slices, and therefore you, need, you make more images. But even with five millimeters, now you are able to depict the nodule, what you are looking for. But even five millimeters is not adequate. You need one millimeter to identify the nodule in detail. But as a drawback, now you have 300 images to store, to document, to save, to transport, and to read. But this is the quality you really need to, to image infectious diseases of the lung. If we are talking about uh, CT, then we also have to talk about radiation exposure. And the natural ex radiation exposure in the, uh, is about one millisievert. And the imaging 
come, uh, counts to, uh, for CT, it comes with 5 millisievert. You can reduce that to 1 millisievert in so-called low-dose CT. And even, but we have also a technique available which comes without any radiation, and that is MRI, and in the abdomen, it's ultrasound. And we also have to take to consider that those patients uh, which are severely immunocompromised, which might have undergone um, uh, a, a transplantation with conditional therapy, they frequently undergo total body irradiation, which is mentioned in red. And the dosage of total body irradiation is between 12 and 14 gray. And we are talking about millisievert. And if we are talking about Röntgen rays, then gray and sievert is the same, but we have millisievert. So if we perform a total body irradiation that has 14,000 milligray, and we have to compare that with 5 millisievert, which is uh, comparable of uh, CT. So our diagnostic radiation is five uh, locks lower as compared to the uh, therapeutic radiation dose. So it doesn't matter in those patients, but while we have a high mortality of 10 or 30 percent. So radiation is not an issue. Anyway, we, can, we are able to reduce radiation. And this group has uh, simulated what happens if we take a low-dose CT of those immunocompromised patients, and they reduce it from a standard dose down to a low dose. In, uh, and you see the infiltrate in the lingula here, and they still depict the infiltrate in an almost identical condition in the lingula in the low-dose CT. So I think low-dose CT is acceptable in those patients if radiation for a certain effect uh, matters, really. Also, MRI is a possibility, and you see the infiltrate, the fungal invas invasive fungal pneumonia of this person with, uh, suffering from AML, and she underwent MRI on the same day. And this is a standard MRI scan with and without contrast agent, and you, you clearly can depict the lesion in MRI. This has been uh, done in a 19-month-old child, female child, and you can still see the infiltrate in the right upper lobe with and without contrast enhancement. Very impressive um, technique. Another problem, really problem, is documentation. And here I scanned a hard copy film that was, been, uh, that was brought to our hospital, and I zoomed out one of the images, and I was not, it was not necessary to anonymize the images because you cannot read the ne patient's name, really. I only for safety reason anonymized the name of the radiologist. But in the characters, you know what you would expect, how these characters should look like. But in the anatomy of the lung, there you don't know how this anatomy should look like. We are looking for the disease. Though this type of documentation is not adequate, filming, film copies are not adequate anymore. And even more severe in this scan where he brought a grayscale with us, and this is the whitest white that the beamer has, this is the blackest black that the beamer has, and this is the blackest black the radiology had. So he throws away a, ra a wide range of grayscales only by documentation. So this kind of mild disease but severe pneumonia cannot be depicted in such an image quality. And paper, you can really totally forget. Paper is only useful to document that a, that a CT at all has been done, but not to demonstrate the images. We need digital images either on CD-ROM or transmitted by the, via the Internet. These are cheaper and um, better to, uh, for diagnosis. We come to the next section of my presentation, and that deals with the characterization of the images if we have done adequate imaging. And this is a radiologist sitting at his computer, and he now found the focus of infection, and he tries to characterize and to describe what's going on there. And this characterization is sometimes a little bit difficult, like sitting in a garden and trying to differentiate those eggs from eggplants, which on the first view look very similar. 
So the ERTC has given us some um, ideas how fungal infections should look like, and we left the major and the minor crit criteria, and we stay at these three criteria. And I would focus on one uh, relevant criterion that is not necessary anymore, but I think, think it is still very helpful, and that is the halo sign. And the halo sign is something that is around the moon when the weather is cloudy and the moon is shining, and this is uh, the halo in the, in the sky, and this is the halo in its first description in the literature, described in 84, when CT was relatively new, developed, and here you, still, you also see the halo sign. And nowadays we have a little bit improvement in imaging quality, and I will focus that and zoom that a little bit here. You also have a halo sign. This is a dense nodule, which has no um, airspace inside, only in the periphery, which is surrounded by ground glass opacification. Um, ground glass opacification means a higher density of the lung parenchyma in comparison to the normal tissue, while you still can depict the underlying lung architecture here. And I brought a bunch of those halos with me, a small nodule surrounded by ground glass opacification to give you the impression how these halos should look like, a dense nodule surrounded by ground glass. And another one also in a child, this, uh, this works. There you see the dense nodule surrounded by ground glass, limited by a fissure as you see it here. And here uh, another halo, but stop. My daughter came along and said, oh, Daddy, what are you doing there? Uh, you're having a small figure there. And do you know what my daughter identified on that image? She identified this as a little ghost. And why did she do that? Not only of the, due to the shape of that lesion, but also due to the black dots in here, which giving us the, uh, the impression of eyes. And these dots are not in the periphery of that lesion. They are in the center or in the middle of that lesion. And if they are in, in the middle, then they, they are not, uh, of course, not dots anymore. This is nothing else but an open bronchus. And this is an air-filled bronchus giving us a positive pneumobronchogram. A positive pneumobronchogram is a sign of bronchial pneumonia and not of fungal disease. Now, so this is possibly a bacterial disease. So we have to take care and look uh, carefully where these positive pneumobronchograms are to identify which are fungi and which might be bacterial infections. I skipped there. Um, but what, what is this halo at all? The halo, uh, as uh, shown in this literature, is surrounding such a nodule in the lung, and it's a bleeding, a hemorrhage of the surrounding tissue. So there is still some air in the tissue, and uh, this residual air, together with a mild bleeding, gives us the halo sign. Here we have another halo, and it's not necessarily surrounding the whole lesion, but as in this case, we have a small atlectasis adjacently to the halo sign, so we might also have well-defined uh, parts of the nodule. So what, uh, what about the value of that nodule? And here's a workup of a, of a drug trial of the ERRTC in invasive pulmonary aspergillosis with a huge number of patients. And this group found the halo sign in about two-thirds of their patients. And they found that if the halo sign was evident, then the response rate to antifungal treatment was significantly better in comparison to those patients where the halo sign was not evident. And they also found a moderate, but at all, it is a significant better three-month survival if the halo sign was evident. So I think the halo sign is something valuable we should look, like, look for, and it is something that frequently can be treated successfully with antifungals. So we have learned now that these halos are something dangerous and that those halos might kill our patients. From a radiological point of view, and radiologists have to take care for all of the patients, not only for severely immunocompromised, from a radiological point of view, this is something that has to be discussed. 
because we see HALO in a, a huge variety of diseases. For instance, in this case of cytomegalovirus pneumonia, in this case of Kaposi sarcoma, also HALO signs here. In this case of Loeffler syndrome, also clearly a HALO sign here. In this case of Morbus wegener, also clearly a HALO sign. So, um, and also infectious diseases like in uh, such an um, immunocompromised host and also the aircraft can sign might take place and be evident in um, bacterial infections like in this um, uh, infected port system with septic abscesses due to Staphylococcus aureus. And another problem is that we have to evaluate our images very carefully and we have to zoom in very See, uh, very strong and, only, and not look on a tiny image on a huge monitor, we have to zoom it to full screen. And then we are able to depict that this is not a halo sign. These are nodules. In the periphery, you can depict the single nodules, while in the center of the lesion, the nodules superimpose each other and giving us the impression of a central uh, solid lesion. But there is something in our natural environment that looks like this, uh, periphery small nodules conflating to each other, and that is a galaxy. And I brought to you Galaxy M13 to have an, a clue why I'm describing that. And the galaxy sign is not uh, indicative for fungus disease, it's indicative for sarcoidosis. To, to remember, the, the halo sign is a ground glass opacification pattern and not consisting from certain nodules. But, as I mentioned before, radiologists have to take care for all patients, not only for immunocompromised ones. And if you look at these images, then you'll see this is also not a halo. This is some streaky thing. This is a speculation. And that gives us the idea that it might not be an infectious disease, stuff that might be a bronchial carcinoma. And this, however, is also a lesion that is surrounded by a ground class opacification, clearly uh, different from the normal tissue. This is clearly a halo. But not, none of these patients fulfills the host criteria that have also been dis defined by the ERRTC, and therefore none of this patient is suffering from fungal disease. This is, as I mentioned before, a bronchial carcinoma, and this is a metastasis of a leiomyosarcoma. And frequently, sarcoma metastasis, also ENT metastases, giving, are giving us a halo sign. But these patients are not fulfilling the host criteria. And that is an, a topic that you have to bring to your radiologist and to discuss the certain patient with your radiologist. Another feature we are seeing on imaging, that is the air Kreskin sign, that is a central mucus ball within a cavitation giving us an air Kreskin sign here and also here. Not a severely immunocompromised patient, but a patient suffering from severe emphysema, inhaling corticoids. And this is um, the specimen looking like, the, here you see the necrosis of the fungus ball within the cavitation giving us the air Kreskin sign. Also in other kinds of immunocompromised patients, like immunoglobulin deficiencies, you see those central mucus balls within those cavitations, and they even might be moving. Here this patient has been investigated in prone position. You, th you can see the uh, spine is in the anterior, is, and he is lying in his, in, at his front. And in the first investigation, the ball is in the dependent position. In the second investigation, we scanned uh, supine. It's also in a dependent position. So it's a moving ball. Another range of immunosuppressive uh, patients might be um, this pa patient inhal inhaling corticoids for a long while. And you see the thickening of the tracheobronchial tree going and down to the segmental bronchi and uh, thinning the lumen or um, reducing the lumen of the tracheobronchial tree. And after treatment uh, of the identified um, disease, you see this was reversible. The lumen is now wider two months later and the thickening has uh, been reduced. And I skip that. Um, fungus disease is a thing that 
uh, takes place um, in a wide variety of immunostatuses. And pulmonologists frequently see fungus disease not as an invasive inf infection. They see frequently fungus disease as an allergic reaction, like in this case with allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. And you, you see also lesions here, but this is not an infection. This is mucus retention. This is um, so-called tree in bud sign. Um, and after treatment of uh, the fungus here, you see um, the, um, the restitution of the lung parenchyma is almost complete. You only see residual bronchiectasis here. But this is not an infection. This is an allergic reaction to the aspergillus. Frequently, I'm asked whether we are able to distinguish between different Organisms, and therefore I tried whether we are able to distinguish those superheroes from each other. And a huge, a huge group has been investigated, those patients suffering from aspergillus and bacterial pneumonias, and they found no difference in certain uh, findings. They found only a significant difference in the halo sign and also in the aircraft scan sign. However, they found that the halo sign is highly specific for invasive aspergillosis. I skip that. And I go to the differentiation whether we are able to separate aspergillus from candida. And also here, no significant difference. So this study concluded we can see everything in both nodules is evident in candida pneumonia and in aspergillus pneumonia. Also, consolidations are evident in candida pneumonia as well as in aspergillus pneumonia. Another uh, topic, another feature is the reversed halo sign that is evident, for, for instance, in pulmonary embolism, in cryptogenic organizing pneumonias, and also in bronchial carcinomas. So it's also not a specific feature, and it is due to the occlusion of a pulmonary artery giving us a infarction pneumonia in the periphery that also takes place in fungal infection that invades the pulmonary artery, and the green line is the place or the shape where the pulmonary artery should be, and also here the pulmonary artery should have a wall here, but it's, nothing, uh, it's not evident any, anymore. And you can imagine if the patient reconstitutes and the fungus is removed, then you have a huge hole in your vessel and the patient is bleeding. And this has a high mortality rate if this happens, really. And radiology might be helpful, for instance, with embolization of such a pseudoaneurysm. And here you see the metallic artifacts afterwards to, uh, to come until the patient, uh, to, to check the time and to, um, until the patient is in a condition where a upper lobe resection can be done. Finally, I would finish with a short monitor of those lesions, and these lesions develop not only by a complete restitution, they frequently grow, and it's very hard to rate whether this is a treatment failure or a success. So um, a, a, a workup in France has been done about the size of those lesions, and the relative volume at baseline was 100%, while it was 160% after one week. And is this a resolvement or is it progression? And it stayed in, increased to the baselines at 136%, and it took up to three weeks until a significant shrinkage was evident. And here you see such an example from our own clinics. You see the development of those nodules, and at the day the patient reconstituted, um, we had a significant growth of the lesion, and this is nothing else but a, a, an invasion of the immune system, also identifying the pneumonia. And the, um, the immunocytes, they invade in this region, and then we see it on CT scan. And this is not necessarily a failure if the patient is well and reconstitutes, and it takes a while until the resolving is evident. Here you see after one, day 108, we see a significant shrinkage, and I think there is still infectious element in that lesion. And um, I would like to skip all these things to keep in time, and um, the, all these invasive uh, th stuff I would like to skip, and I would like to uh, call you to, uh, to build up a team with your radiologists and to provide the relevant clinical information in this interdisciplinary discussion. 
to choose the adequate scanning technique for your certain patients, in, including the different organ systems, and to discuss the differential diagnosis, even the non-infections ones with your radiologists, and build up a team and include your local radiologist. Thank you for your attention. Sir Dr. Boysede, bu çok etkileyici sunumdan dolayı e, teşekkür ediyorum ve sunumu katkı ve soruları açıyorum. Mikrofonu şuraya alabilir miyiz lütfen? Also, Michael, the question was whether mucomycosis can show the halo sign. Um, yes, mucomycosis can show the halo sign. However, mucomycosis is so rapidly progressing and so invasive to the vessels um, that we frequently do not see the short while where the mucomycosis shows the halo sign. Frequently, mostly the patients suffering from mucomycosis show up with a complete lobe infarction. And then we have a reversed halo sign and a necrosis of a complete lobe or even more. Dr. Voysal, could you please comment on the relation between the radiology and the serological markers? Yes, there is a connection between the, for instance, Galactomanan assay and the indication for a CT scan. That is um, the only connection I would see nowadays. If a CT scan shows uh, nothing and Galactomanan shows a positive finding, that is a, uh, an issue that as a radiologist I cannot solve. This might um, be, uh, have uh, different conditions. But if a uh, Galactomanan is getting positive. That is a good uh, indication to perform CT scan, even if the patient is asymptomatic, um, despite of fever, of, of course. Um, the, um, the course of such a, um, such a lesion and uh, the interpretation of the course of the Galactomanan assay, that is something that has to be interpreted depending on the certain patient and the development of his individual immune system that might change during the time as well. Ben de Sayın Hüseyin'e bir soru sormak istiyorum izin verirseniz. Ee, nötropenik ateş hastalarda geniş spektrumlu antibakteriyel tedaviye cevap vermeyen hastalarda dördüncü günden sonra geliyor mu? I, I don't have a can you, can you repeat that in English? Febril nötropenik hastalarda Febril nötropenik hastalarda dördüncü günden sonra ateş devam ettiği durumlarda işte seri olarak galaktomandan ve e, CT incelemeleri yapılması gerekiyor kılavuzlara göre. Hastanın herhangi bir klinik semptomu, akciğer semptomu olmadığı durumlarda acaba CT vurgusuyla bulunan e, durumların oranı nedir? Yani semptomu olmayan hastalarda da hastalarda akciğer radyolojisinde tomografide bulgu bulabiliyor muyuz? Bunun semptomu olan ve olmayanlarda bir oransal olarak bir e, değer açıklayabilir misiniz? Teşekkür ederim. The question was 
in fibrile neutropenic patients. We are doing serial CT scans and uh, galactomannan uh, searching. Do you have any data about uh, the patients with symptoms and without symptoms? Um, there, is not, there is no data available for that question. Um, however, um, frequently patients in the beginning, or usually patients in the beginning of their disease do not have any symptoms despite of fever. Um, during the development of huge lesions, they develop the thing that you know, rib pain, breathing pain from the pleural um, alteration. Um, but those tiny halos that I showed you, these do not result in symptoms. This Doctor Oysa, şimdi e, gerçekten gene burada olmasından ve sunmaktan dolayı e, onurlanacağımız üçüncü konuşmacıyı davet etmek istiyorum. E, Doktor Markus Rumke, e, Berlin Üniversitesi'nden. Ve kendisi gerçekten bizim takip etmek et, etmeyi tercih ettiğimiz birçok e, kılavuzun da bu konudaki e, ilk yazarlarından biri. E, kendisi dahiliyeci ama e, onkoloji ve hematoloji bölüm başkanı e, aynı zamanda. E, Markus Runke üstelik son günlerde e, sonuçlarını heyecanla beklediğimiz AIS çalışmasının da yürütücüsü. Kendisinden şimdi tedaviye yaklaşımla ilgili gelişmeleri dinleyeceğiz. It's our pleasure to have you here. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you for this kind introduction, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, good morning again. The second uh, talk uh, for me to uh, to you about uh, fungal infections. The area I talk uh, about within the next 30 minutes or so is the treatment of invasive fungal infection, uh, primarily in a hospital setting. This is the area I'm, I'm talking about. So we, we have uh, a couple of issues with regard to treatment of fungal infection um, we are dealing with in the hospitals. Uh, uh, for the past 10 years, we are struggling actually with uh, the development of new fungicidal uh, drugs. Actually, we do not have that many with the azoles. Uh, Isavuconazole is currently under development uh, by Basilea and nowadays by Astellas, which took over Basilea. The, we, with the Echnocannons, we have three on the markets, and there is some work on an oil caspofungin by Merck right now. And clearly, we have some small molecules, I would call these, with a selective activity against certain uh, fungi. But uh, no one of these uh, yet uh, until uh, before coming to the markets. We are discussing the role of combination therapy uh, for many years, clearly the role of cytokines and immune modulation as well. And uh, a huge debate is about the correlation between in vitro findings and the clinical findings. And what we want to know uh, is what is the gold standard? What is the best option we do have for treatment of various infections and clearly and finally um, the position of liposomal, liposomal formulations. So first of all, I just want to introduce with you, to you one of the very last self-experiments in, uh, in human medicine. And uh, this happened, this was published in Lancet in 1969, so it, it's quite a little bit historic uh, about. So this is about a German, and actually this is a German surgeon. And you know surgeons, I know, is there any surgeon here in the room? No? Okay, so I'm lucky. So surgeons are different. They're very different. They do not care about infectious disease. They do not care about microbiology. They just cut, you know, cut and the patient is cleared. So, but this surgeon was very unusual. He had interest in fungal infections, and he had a friend in the microbiology department 
who gave him 200 agar plates. Very unusual, very unusual. But actually, he wanted to be famous. He was seeking for a high impact factor. It was Dr. Krause, what's the name? Very German name, actually. So, so what did that man? He took these 200 agar plates and swapped every, every plate and put the huge suspension of Canada in one glass of water and he'd drink it. Who would repeat that experiment? Is anyone in the audience who would do the same? 200 agar plates in one glass of water and to drink it? Only a surgeon can do that. Surgeons never die. Sur surgeons never get sick. They are strong, you know, they never got sick. So what, what happened to this guy? He had some toxic reactions and his friend from the microbiology documented what happened to him. He feel toxic for two hours. Actually, the, his friend took a blood culture and proved candidemia and he took his urine uh, to look for candiduria and he felt sick for nine hours and unfortunately, he did not die. So he proved you do not die from candidemia, you know, but only a surgeon did not die. Many, but if you have an immunocompromised patient, these will die. These are our patients we treat with. And, but it was essential here, he proved that candida comes from the gut and translocate in the bloodstream. That's the proof of concept. So it's a very strong concept, isn't it? Who would repeat that with mucor? Would you swallow mucor and look whether you get the lung infiltrate? I wouldn't do that. Maybe someone in the audience of you want to be famous. So, okay, so then you get a Lancet publication, but you may die from that experiment, I don't know. So we, we have a kind of concepts here. For example, in the neutropedic patient, this is the slide I have, have been given by Dr. Ben de Pau from uh, Holland, which in the neutropenic patient has a concept that if the patient uh, has a low leukocyte count, that's what we call the nadir, he is very susceptible for invasive fungal infection. Where, while he is neutropenic, he may get febrile, that's a blue line over here, and during that episode, he may develop these clinical features we have just seen, such as the halosign and others. And uh, it may take a long time to detect the organism by culture, by mycology, uh, whether antigen or PCR. And we have the strategy of uh, intervention very early. We call that prophylaxis or if the patient gets febrile over here during neutropenia, that is what we call empiric antifungal therapy. If the patient has some kind of su suspected lung infiltrate, that's what we call preemptive approach. But if we have the culture in mycology, we call it proven. So in many times, we are pretty late with the diagnosis here. We have a, a scenario before that, and it's sometimes difficult really to wait until the patient uh, is proven, the disease is proven. These are the options we have. I call the antimycotic tree. We have three different groups of uh, antifungal agents. We have the polyanes with the nystatin, amphotericin B, and the liposomal compounds. Uh, the liposomal compounds are not all available on all market all over the world. We have the azoles, so the first one in clinic practice, ketoconazole, is no more any use. We have the fluco and itraconazole, and the more recent one like voriconazole and posaconazole. And the third group are the echinocandines with three uh, drugs on the market, caspofungin, mycofungin, and lefungin. We have two other choices I will not mention in detail. So now tell me, which is the best drug uh, you want to choose. Who is interested in football? Who's, yeah? You're looking football tomorrow. Tomorrow is an important day, isn't it, in Turkey? Final game, is it, is it correct? Yeah, correct. I, are you familiar with these two people here from Germany? Have you ever heard about these? What do you think? Who is the best of these two? This look a very smart guy. Smart guy. And this is, you know, he, Brill and Bart and so on. Huh? So, who is the trainer of the champion, of the German champion? 
Is that your Pankus or Jürgen Klopp from Borussia Dortmund? Okay, you can't know that because this one, Borussia Dortmund, nobody expected this is a champion in Germany. They won the championship in Germany, so not the, the nice guy, but the other one, they, they won it. So, but if you want to treat invasive fungal infection, they are not all the same, and all drugs does not work with all fungal infections. So we do not have the best one of all. We have to consider the yeast group with different uh, pathogens, Canada albicans and non albicans species with Cryptococcus neoformans and trichosporin, for example, and we have the molds with Aspergillus or Fusarium species or even Mucor we have to be talking about, and we have the endemic fungi. So agents may work against yeast, but not um, essentially against molds as well. So we have to know what to do. If I start with Canada infection, and you have heard about the epidemiology in Turkey, we have this kind of information for Europe, a seven country survey published in 2004 by the Italian uh, Dr. Totorano. And if you look on certain subgroups, for example, hematology patient, you see they have a very different uh, scenario in terms of epidemiology. Uh, the majority of surgical patients have 60% Canada albicans, but this patient group has much less albicans. They have other pathogens more predominant, tropicalis or parapsilosis. So you have to know the patient group you treat and you have to know the epidemiology in this patient group in order to have the right choice, the first choice of your drug. And if you go further to age groups, if you're going to the young uh, patients, you see a huge amount of parapsilosis. So younger patients have different pathogens than elderly patients. Elderly patients may have much more frequent labrata as bloodstream infection or even colonized. Labrata is a kind of a marker of elderly patients. We do not understand really why is that? What is the genetic background be behind that? But not only the underlying disease, but the age is essential for the pathogen you may develop. So this information may help for. And the other thing is mortality. Uh, we have differences in mortality between bacterial septic shock and candida septic shock. And uh, there is a huge difference in terms of survival. Less patients with candida septic shock will survive. Why is that? Maybe we do not choose the right treatment in the first wave, 44.5% appropriate treatment for candida, but more than 80% appropriate treatment for bacterial infection. We do not have candida sepsis in mind, so we treat not appropriately when the patient had septic shock. And you see median time until um, treatment is delivered takes 35 hours for Canada and 5.5 hours for bacterial infection. That's a huge database from the US, 22 US centers for 5,700 patients. So this is essential with our four strategies actually. What are the trials we have? Uh, published in that area. We have a couple of trials um, in the past, starting with the so-called REX-1 trial in 1994. And if you look over time until 2006, they may look like all the same. They may have efficacy around 60 to 70, maybe to 80 percent. There may be not much difference in between. But if you look on two trials, um, which have a difference between arm A and arm B, which is significant, we just have two of these. So the trial fluconazole versus anilafungin, better response with the echinocandin, lower response, that's the orange bar is fluconazole. And if you look at the first uh, trial fluconazole, orange bar over here, and you see over here fluconazole and over here, the response to the fluconazole decrease over time. Maybe fluconazole is our penicillin uh, in bacterial infection. We have overused it. We have less response with the drug nowadays. And the other trial is uh, the trial combination of embisome with the monoclonal antibody against the heat shock 90 uh, a fungumab. 
as compared to a liposomal amphotericin B as well. And you see a huge difference for the combination. This anti this, that antibody is not yet on the market, so we cannot use it really. What are the role of the echnocannons or the primary advantages here? Uh, we have to know that we only can use as IV. We don't have oral preparations here, but it's just once daily dosing. We do not have a dose modification in renal insufficiency for at least anilafungin and mycofungin. Maybe a little bit in caspofungin, but whether this is clinically relevant, we don't know. No dose uh, modification in moderate hepatic impairment. We have an excellent safety profile, which is similar to fluconazole for all these uh, agents. And we have a potential activity as shown in vitro and in animal models against the biofilm on central venous catheter, uh, which may help uh, uh, for clinical uh, uh, strategies. And the drug, drug interaction potential is pretty low, which is different from the adults. And what we need to know as well is not only the pharmacokinetic and dynamic properties, but we have to know the in vitro susceptibility data as well. We can say what is different to bacterial infections, we have very few secondary resistance. There is, we don't have plasmids in fungi, similar to bacteria. Bacteria have plasmids. That's why they develop resistance. We don't ha see that in fungi that much. What we see is primary resistance, what means some agents, I have uh, shown all the agents here in the first uh, row, are differently susceptible uh, to that pathogens here. For example, if you go to fluconazole over here, we have less activity against glabrata and uh, no activity almost against cruzii. And if you go to the echnocannons, these are the three echnocannons and lafungin, caspofungin, mycofungin, we have very low values over here, which means we have a very high in vitro susceptibility. Maybe only candida parpsilosis have the highest value here. And indeed, we have seen in clinical practice that candida parpsilosis fungemia, if it's treated with an echnocandin, has a high likelihood of failure. So that correlates with the clinic. I would not treat parpsilosis infection with uh, an echnocandin. Do we have differences between these uh, three drugs? Yeah, we do have some. We have difference from the pharmacokinetic background in terms of difference in clearance, difference in AUC, and clearly in difference in the way we, we, we use the drugs. We need a loading um, with anilafungin and caspofungin, and that, which is different from the maintenance dose, but we do not need that with mycofungin. Mycofungin does not need a loading dose. You use the loading and maintenance dose similar. And clearly the half time, the half life of the drug is very different. 26.5 hours with fungin and only 9 to 11 hours with caspofungin. And they are differently biotransformed in the body as well. And so there are some differences. But what might be more important are differences in terms of efficacy in patients. These are a list of secondary endpoints from clinical trials. And I have looked on the overall mortality in that particular trial. And if you look on these comparative trials, mycofungin against embisome or caspofungin against amphotericin B or voriconazole against amphotericin B followed by fluco or anilafungin against fluconazole, interestingly, the lowest mortality we have seen with an echnocannon, and this was anilafungin in that case here. So there is some uh, sign that these agents are not all the same. And it may be importantly to stress whether we have a dose-related efficacy. This is a trial using different doses of caspofungin here. The licensed dose is this one, caspofungin starting 70 milligram and then maintenance 50 milligram. But they used three times, three times the dose of caspofungin as a comparison. Interestingly, the response rate was a slightly uh, different, but not significant. But what might be of interest is the response rate with regard to the catheter. If the catheter was not removed or changed, 
we had a higher response, more than 10% higher response in the high-dose group, which underlines the potential to work against the biofilm on the catheter. You may have a dose-related efficacy against the biofilm over here. So that might be a reason to use higher doses in some patients. Um, the other concept is dose escalation, which we have here. This has been published as a poster yet. Um, this was used uh, um, by a group in the U.S. Um, they used anlafungin first, and then they de-escalated by day five, and they had a couple of uh, criteria. De-escalation was to um, um, fluconazole primarily. If the patient had negative blood culture, could swallow, good GI tract, and he had no contraindication for azotherapy. Uh, so, and they have uh, looked uh, uh, on this strategy whether it works in, uh, in their patient group. They had two phases. The first phase was uh, when patients were treated like always, 14 days on lafungin, and the next episode was uh, patients were treated five days with lafungin and then stepped down to fluconazole. And with regard to clinical success in these phases, there was no difference uh, between phase one and phase two. So that may be a safe and cost-effective approach to lower your cost and not uh, to harm the patient. And this uh, may help you to use uh, echinocannins as for choice agents. This multivariate analysis uh, presented as a poster by uh, David Annis a couple of years ago showed that we have a couple of uh, significant factors which reduce mortality, uh, that especially uh, if you use an echinocandin and if you remove the catheter in these patients. So these are the two major issues. If you want to reduce mortality uh, in patients that septic by kinodemia. The guidelines have been discussed already. I will not go in detail. We have guidelines for the non-neutropenic and neutropenic patients over here, where the echinocandins play a central role over here. We have guidelines from different countries as well. We have developed in Germany these guidelines published in 2011 in mycosis here. We have our expert group uh, published that echinocannins are really a one uh, evidence uh, in our guidelines. I just want to refer to that journal for your information. What's about aspergillus? Aspergillus is totally different from that. Aspergillus, as you heard, is primarily not an uh, fungemic disease, but it's lung disease. Uh, Aspergillus spores were inhaled, so the lungs, according to that uh, survey, is a primarily um, location of infection. More than 50% of the patients do have lung disease, but we have a huge amount, almost 20% multi-organ infection. So this is, uh, again, maybe different. You have seen these kind of slides that only in severe cases you may identify this infection by regular uh, chest X-ray, but nowadays you need more subtle uh, CT scanning in order to detect that. You have seen that marvelous talk by uh, Klaus-Peter Heusel. The, this the trial which really uh, was uh, leading the route for treatment of aspergillosis was published 10 years ago, actually, a comparative trial, Voriconazole against Amphotericin B, uh, showing uh, a 20% difference in favor of Voriconazole, 52.8 versus 31.6%. And if you look on that graph here and that dot plot, you see all subgroups really who received Voriconazole, which means this box, this box uh, benefit from the new drug. And you see the survival difference over here between the two treatments, which was significant. This trial changed our uh, strategies uh, during the past 10 years or so uh, using voriconazole. We have trials uh, looking um, on the clinical practice, whether this has impact in the everyday practice. So this is a trial from France. And you see here, if you treat patients with voriconazole, which means that line, they have a higher chance of survival in invasive aspergillosis uh, in comparison to other drugs which are licensed for that indication. So that really uh, has changed our um, uh, strategies. And in particular, if you have CNS infection, we do have now a quite amount of data for various, even the rare fungi, 
that show that you may have even a long-term survival of more than 30 percent, which we have never seen before with amphotericin B. And with amphotericin B, actually, all patients did die by at least day 300, and now we have long-time survivors here. So that changed our strategy. What about caspofungin for first-line therapy? We have this trial in hematological patients, and unfortunately, the trial only found 33% complete and partial response, and which almost failed significant. It was expected at least 35% should respond to that agent. But we have some idea how caspofungin is working or an echnocannin is working in that area. And probably an echnocannin cannot be regarded as drug of first choice for aspergillus. And that may be underscored that the activity of echnocannin against aspergillus are only static. It's not fungicidal. Um, so that may be the reason why it's less effective as compared to worry or ambisome. These are the guidelines, recommendation, the American Society for Infectious Disease. We have primary therapy with voriconazole. We have several therapy with all the other agents, including liposomal amphotericin B, caspofungin, maybe even posaconazole and itraconazole. And what really is a key recommendation over here is the early initiation of therapy is strong with strongly suspected invasive aspergillus warranted while diagnostic evaluation is conducted. So the principle and the hospital setting is if you have a patient at risk with aspergillosis and may you have a suggested sign by CT scan like the HALO sign, you should start therapy before you really have proven the infection. Otherwise, you lose time and you lose patient life. So that's really a key issue. Combination, and that's, these are my final slides, is uh, given as one option by the IDSA guidelines. And we have this trial by TNMAR in transplant, hematological transplant setting. And you see here the probability of survival was better in the combination group, as, which means caspofungin plus voriconazole, as compared to voriconazole. This was not a randomized trial. This was just a retrospective analysis. But really, that changed strategies as well. So we were quite keen to see data from a prospective trial. And this was uh, recently um, performed uh, comparing voriconazole in combination with enlafungin versus, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that, that should be an, uh, voriconazole and not amphotericin B. That's my fault. So we have a combination of voriconazole plus enlafungin versus voriconazole as primary therapy. This was a trial in hematological patient, primarily in stem cell transplant. It was one-to-one -one randomized. We had this uh, uh, therapy with the given uh, dosages, as you know. The combination was given for two to four weeks, and switch to voriconazole was optional after two weeks. And uh, you could even switch to oral if, you, if the patient was able. And the primary endpoint of that trial, which was shown as a poster on ECMED just a few weeks ago, was overall survival at week six. So keep in mind, this is the first, the first trial which looked on overall survival as a primary endpoint. All our tr other trials looked on efficacy at, at end of therapy. That's a very ambitious goal to look on survival. So if you look on survival after six weeks as a primary endpoint, you see the curves are disparate. We had a better response in the combination therapy, 10% better survival, which means 10% less mortality with the combination as compared to voriconazole alone. That's a very interesting idea. However, this endpoint did not reach statistical significant. So you have to answer in clinical practice whether it's relevant to your patient if you can lower mortality by 10%, uh, even if it's not significant. So that will be a huge discussion. So I'm at the end of my talk. And you are familiar with these two? I, I, I believe that. Yeah. So uh, who, are, who will be the champion? Both. Both. 
No, no. The gentleman over there has a Fenerbahce. Yeah. What's about Ankara? 50-50. Ankara? 50-50. No, Ankara is like that, isn't it? Okay. It's like in Germany. Berlin is going that. You know, Berlin is the worst football team in Germany at all. We are the capital, but it's the worst team. So I have shown you the. But from my perspective, the best one is he. Is he? Mesut, he, he is our, our gold standard, you know? <laughs> but, but he is your gold standard as well, I assume, you know? Unfortunately, he has both. He's Turkish and he's German, so he, maybe it's, it's a problem. I don't see it, it's a problem, okay. So I summarize my year. We need an early inter initiation of antifungal therapy in high-risk patient. I showed you some data to support that. We have the preemptive strategy I did not touch for uh, time reasons here, really. We nowadays have the echnin cannings as preferred antifungal agents for first-line treatment of candidemia and invasive candida infections. Uh, with aspidillus, it's different. We have the azoles, primarily voriconazole, as antifungal agent of first-line treatment and not the echnin cannings. Amphotericin B nowadays is regarded uh, as a second line treatment, less response, higher toxicity here. And we, see we have the first data that combination is active, and I think it may prove clinical outcomes uh, if you come to the future. And now I end with a slide I end before my first talk. Uh, I want you to have, to come all of you to Berlin to the World Congress of Mycology, Isham in June this year. You're all welcome. Thank you for your attention. Mükemmel konuşması için çok teşekkür ediyoruz ee, ve salona sunumu katkı ve soru için açıyoruz. He is going to bed. He is not, no more translating. No one is translating. How early uh, should we start with antifungal treatments and what's the definition of uh, early? It may differ between aspergillus or mold infection and candida. In Canada, we do have uh, risk factors we know about, and we do have uh, things like the colonization uh, index, etc., or the Canada score, which we may use. Here we have blood cultures, which we, uh, how we can prove the invasiveness of the infection. 50% of the blood cultures may be negative, so this is not the only point to start with, but we need the high-risk scenario of the patient with septic, septic shock, and high colonization, for example, that may be patient to treat uh, preemptive with the uh, antifungal. And with the aspergillus and mold, we have this uh, radiology techniques around together with uh, uh, markers like galactomanan, etc., which nowadays uh, drives us to treat on the preemptive way as well. Thank you very much for your excellent